The Hitler Diaries, German, Hitler Tatesbücher, were a series of 60 volumes of journals purportedly written by Adolf Hitler, but forged by Konrad Kuzhau between 1981 and 1983. The diaries were purchased in 1983 for 9.3 million Deutsche Marks, 2.33 million pounds or 3.7 million dollars, by the West German news magazine Stern, which sold surrealization rights to several news organizations. One of the publications involved was the Sunday Times, who asked their independent director, the historian Hugh Trevor Roper, to authenticate the diaries, he did so, pronouncing them genuine. At the press conference to announce the publication, Trevor Roper announced that on reflection he had changed his mind, and other historians also raised questions concerning their validity. Rigorous forensic analysis, which had not been performed previously, quickly confirmed that the diaries were fakes. Kuzhout, born and raised in East Germany, had a history of petty crime and deception. In the mid-1970s he began selling Nazi memorabilia which he was smuggling from the East, but found he could raise the prices by forging additional authentication details to link ordinary souvenirs to the Nazi leaders. He began forging paintings by Hitler and an increasing number of notes, poems, and letters, until he produced his first diary in the mid to late 1970s. The West German journalist with Stern who discovered the diaries and was involved in their purchase was Gerd Heidmann, who had an obsession with the Nazis. When Stern started buying the diaries, Heidmann stole a significant proportion of the money. Kozhau and Heidmann spent time in prison for their parts in the fraud, and several newspaper editors lost their jobs. The story of the scandal was the basis for the film Selling Hitler, 1991, for the British channel ITV and the German cinema release Tonk. 1992 On April 20, 1945 Adolf Hitler's 56th birthday Soviet troops were on the verge of taking Berlin and the Western Allies had already taken several German cities. Hitler's private secretary, Martin Bormann, put into action Operation Seraglio, a plan to evacuate the key and favored members of Hitler's entourage from the Berlin bunker where they were based, the Führer bunker, to an Alpine command center near Berchtesgade and Hitler's retreat in southern Germany. Ten aeroplanes flew out from Ditto airfield under the overall command of General Hans Bauer, Hitler's personal pilot. The final flight out was a Junkers Ju-352 transport plane. Piloted by Major Friedrich Gendelfinger on board were 10 heavy chests under the supervision of Hitler's personal valet sergeant Wilhelm Arndt. The plane crashed into the Heidenholz forest, near the Czechoslovak border. Some of the more useful parts of Gundelfinger's plane were appropriated by locals before the police and SS cordoned off the crash. When Bauer told Hitler what had happened, the German leader expressed grief at the loss of Arndt, one of his most favored servants, and added, I entrusted him with extremely valuable documents which would show posterity the truth of my actions. Apart from this quoted sentence, there is no indication of what was in the boxes. The last of the crash's two survivors died in April 1980, and Bormann had died after leaving the Berlin bunker following Hitler's suicide on April 30, 1945. In the decades following the war, the possibility of a hidden cache of private papers belonging to Hitler became, according to the journalist Robert Harris, a tantalizing state of affairs that was to provide the perfect scenario for forgery. Konrad Kuzhau was born in 1938 in Loba, near Dresden, in what would become East Germany. His parents, a shoemaker, and his wife, had both joined the Nazi party in 1933. The boy grew up believing in the Nazi ideals and idolizing Hitler. Germany's defeat and Hitler's suicide in 1945 did not temper his enthusiasm for the Nazi cause. He held a series of menial jobs until 1957, when a warrant was issued for his arrest in connection with the theft of a microphone from the Loba Youth Club. He fled to Stuttgart, West Germany, and soon drifted into temporary work in petty crime. After running a dance bar during the early 1960s with his girlfriend, Edith Liebel on whom he later married Kuzhau began to create a fictional background for himself. He told people that his real name was Peter Fischer, changed his date of birth by two years and altered the story of his time in East Germany. By 1963 the bar had begun to suffer financial difficulties, and Kuzhau started his career as a counterfeiter, forging 27 Deutsche Marks, DM, worth of luncheon vouchers, he was caught and sentenced to five days in prison. On his release he and his wife formed the Lieblom Cleaning Company, although it provided little income for them. In March 1968, at a routine check at Kuzhau's lodgings, the police established he was living under a false identity and he was sent to Stuttgart's Stamheim prison. In 1970 Kuzhau visited his family in East Germany and discovered that many of the locals held Nazi memorabilia, 
contrary to the laws of the communist government. He saw an opportunity to buy the material cheaply on the black market and make a profit in the West, where the increasing demand among Stuttgart collectors was raising memorabilia prices up to 10 times the amount he would pay. The trade was illegal in East Germany, and the export of what were deemed items of cultural heritage was banned. Among the items smuggled out of East Germany were weapons. In 1974, Kujar rented a shop into which he placed his Nazi memorabilia. The outlet also became the venue for late night drinking sessions with friends and fellow collectors, including Wolfgang Schulz, who lived in the US and became Kujau's agent there. Kujau inflated the value of items in his shop by forging additional authentication details, for example, a genuine First World War helmet, worth a few marks became considerably more valuable after Kujau forged a note indicating that Hitler had worn it at Ypres in late October 1914. In addition to notes by Hitler, he produced documents supposedly handwritten by Bormann, Rudolf Hess, Heinrich Himmler, Hermann Göring, and Joseph Goebbels. He forged passable imitations of his subject's genuine handwriting, but the rest of the work was crude. Kujau used modern stationery such as Letraset to create letterheads, and he tried to make his products look suitably old by pouring tea over them. Mistakes in spelling or grammar were relatively common, particularly when he forged in English, a supposed copy of the 1938 Munich Agreement between Hitler and Neville Chamberlain read, in part. We regard the Ehrman signet last night in the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. In the mid to late 1970s Kujau, an able amateur artist, turned to producing paintings which he claimed were by Hitler, who had been an amateur artist as a young man. Having found a market for his forged works, Kujau created Hitler paintings depicting subjects his buyers expressed interest in, such as cartoons, nudes, and men in action all subjects that Hitler never painted, nor would want to paint, according to Charles Hamilton, a handwriting expert and author of books on forgery. These paintings were often accompanied by small notes, purportedly from Hitler. The paintings were profitable for Kujau. To explain his access to the memorabilia he invented several sources in East Germany including a former Nazi general, the bribable director of a museum and his own brother, whom he reinvented as a general in the East German army. Having found success in passing off his forged notes as those of Hitler, Kojau grew more ambitious and copied, by hand, the text from both volumes of Mein Kampf, even though the originals had been completed by typewriter. Kojau also produced an introduction to a third volume of the work. He sold these manuscripts to one of his regular customers, Fritz Stiefel, a collector of Nazi memorabilia who accepted them and many other Kujau products as genuine. Kujau also began forging a series of war poems by Hitler, which were so amateurish that Kujau later conceded that a 14-year-old collector would have recognized it as a forgery. Gerd Heidmann was born in Hamburg in 1931. During the rise of Hitler his parents remained apolitical, but Heidmann, like many other young boys, joined the Hitler Youth. After the war he trained as an electrician and pursued an interest in photography. He began working in a photographic laboratory and became a freelance photographer for the Deutsche Presse Agentur and Keystone News Agencies, as well as some local Hamburg papers. He had his first work published in Stern in 1951 and four years later joined the paper as a full-time member of staff. From 1961 he covered wars and hostilities across Africa and the Middle East. He became obsessed with these conflicts and other stories on which he worked such as the search for the identity of the German writer B. Traven. Although he was an excellent researcher his colleagues called him der Spurhund, the bloodhound he would not know when to stop investigating, which led to other writers having to finish off the stories from large quantities of notes. On behalf of Stern, in January 1973 Heidmann photographed the Karen II, a yacht that formerly belonged to Goring. The boat was in a pure state of repair and expensive to maintain, but Heidmann took a mortgage on his Hamburg flat and purchased it. While researching the history of the yacht, Heidmann interviewed Goring's daughter, Etta, after which the couple began an affair. Through this relationship and his ownership of the boat he was introduced to a circle of former Nazis. He began to hold parties on the Karen II, with the former SS generals Karl Wolf and Wilhelm Monk as the guests of honor. Wolf and Monk were witnesses at Heidmann's wedding to his third wife in 1979. The couple went on honeymoon to South America accompanied by Wolf, where they met more ex-Nazis including Walter Roth and Klaus Barbie, who were both wanted in the West for war crimes. The purchase of the yacht caused Heidmann financial problems, and in 1976 he agreed terms with Gruner and Jar, Stern's parent company, to produce a book based on the conversations he was having with the former soldiers and SS men. 
When the book went unwritten the material provided by the former SS officers was not sufficiently interesting or verifiable for publication Heidman borrowed increasingly large sums from his employers to pay for the boat's upkeep. In June 1978 he advertised the boat for sale, asking 1.1 million DMS, he received no offers. Monk recommended that Heidman speak to Jacob Tiefenthaler, a Nazi memorabilia collector and a former member of the SS Tiefenthaler was not in a position to buy the yacht, but was happy to act as an agent his endeavors did not produce a sale. Realizing Heidmann's financial circumstances, Tiefenfehler provided him with names of other collectors in the Stuttgart area. The journalist made a trip to the south of Germany and met Stiefel, who purchased some of Goring's effects. Stern, German Four Star, a German weekly news magazine published in Hamburg, was formed by the journalist and businessman Henry Nannen in 1948 to offer scandal, gossip, and human interest stories. It was, According to the German media experts Frank Esser and Uwe Hartung, known for its investigative journalism and was politically left of center. In 1981 Nannen resigned from his position of editor of the magazine and moved to take the role of publisher. In his place Stern had three editors, Peter Koch, Ralph Kilhausen, and Felix Schmidt, who were aided by others including the journal's head of contemporary history, Thomas Wald. Manfred Fischer was CEO of Gruner and Jar until 1981 when he was promoted to the board of Bertelsmann, their parent company, he was replaced by Gerd Schulhillen. Wilfried Sorg was one of the Gruner and Jar managers responsible for international sales. The Sunday Times is a British national broadsheet newspaper, the Sunday sister paper of the Times. In 1968, under the ownership of Lord Thompson, the Sunday Times had been involved in a deal to purchase the Mussolini Diaries for an agreed final purchase price of £250,000, although they had only paid out an initial amount of £60,000. These turned out to be forgeries undertaken by an Italian mother and daughter, Amalia and Rosa Pandini. In 1981 Rupert Murdoch, who owned several other papers in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, purchased Times newspapers LTB, which owned both the Times and its Sunday sister. Murdoch appointed Frank Giles to be the editor of the Sunday Times. The historian Hugh Trevor Roper became an independent national director of the Times in 1974. Trevor Roper who was created Baron Dacker of Glanton in 1979 was a specialist on Nazi Germany, who had worked for the British intelligence services during and after the Second World War. At the war's end he had undertaken an official investigation of Hitler's death, interviewing eyewitnesses to the Fuhrer's last movements. In addition to the official report he filed, Trevor Roper also published The Last Days of Hitler, 1947, on the subject. He subsequently wrote about the Nazis and Hitler's war directives, 1964, and Hitler's place in history, 1965. Newsweek, an American weekly news magazine, was founded in 1933. In 1982 the journalist William Broyles was appointed editor-in-chief, while the editor was Maynard Parker. That year the company had circulation figures of 3 million readers. It is unclear when Kujau produced his first Hitler diary. Stiefel says Kujau gave him a diary on loan in 1975. Schulz puts the date as 1976, while Kujau says he began in 1978, after a month's practice writing in the old German Gothic script Hitler had used. Kujau used one of a pile of notebooks he had bought cheaply in East Berlin and attempted to put the letters A-H in gold on the front purchasing plastic, Hong Kong made letters from a department store, he inadvertently used F-H rather than A-H. He took the black ribbon from a genuine SS document and attached it to the cover using a German army wax seal. For the ink, he bought two bottles of Pelican ink, one black, one blue and mixed them with water so it would flow more easily from the cheap modern pen he used. Finally he sprinkled tea over the pages and bashed the diaries against his desk to give them an aged look. Kujau showed the first volume to Stiefel, who was impressed and thought it a genuine Hitler diary. Stiefel wanted to buy it, but when the forger refused, the pair agreed that the collector could have it on loan. In June 1979, Stiefel asked a former Nazi Party archivist, August Preissack, to verify the authenticity of the diary, which he subsequently did. Preissack showed the diary to Eberhard Jekyll of the University of Stuttgart, who also thought the diary to be genuine and wanted to edit it for publication. News of the diary's existence soon began to filter through to collectors of Hitler memorabilia. At the end of 1979 Tiefenthaler contacted Heidmann to say that Stiefel had shown him around his collection, which included a Hitler diary the only one Kogzhau had forged to that point. According to Hamilton the discovery inflamed Heidmann almost to madness, 
and he aggressively pressed for what would be a journalistic scoop. Stiefel showed Heidmann the diary in Stuttgart in January 1980, telling him it was from a plane crash in East Germany, although he refused to tell the journalist the name of his source. The collector spoke to Kujau to see if he would meet Heidmann, but the forger repeatedly refused Heidmann's requests for nearly a year. Heidmann returned to the Stern offices and spoke to his editor, but both Koch and Nannan refused to discuss the potential story with him, telling him to work on other features. The only person who was interested was Wald, who worked with Heidmann to find the source of the diaries. Their searches for Kujau proved fruitless, so they looked into the crash. Heidmann, who had read Botter's autobiography, knew of Gundelfinger's flight and made a connection between Operation Seraglio and the diary. In November 1980 the two journalists traveled to Dresden and located the graves of the flight's crew. In January 1981 and Thaler gave Kujau's telephone number to Heidmann, telling the journalist to ask for Mr. Fisher, one of Kujau's aliases. During the subsequent phone call Kujau told Heidmann that there were 27 volumes of Hitler's diaries, the original manuscript of the unpublished third volume of Mein Kampf, an opera by the young Hitler called Wieland der Schmied, Wieland the blacksmith, numerous letters, and unpublished papers, and several of Hitler's paintings most of which were still in East Germany. Heidmann offered 2 million DMS for the entire collection and guaranteed secrecy until everything had been brought over the border. Although the pair did not agree to a deal, they agreed to the foundations of a deal. According to Harris, Kujau's condition was that he would only deal directly with Heidmann, something that suited the journalist as a way of keeping other members of Stern away from the story. Heidmann and Wald produced a prospectus for internal discussion, outlining what was available for purchase and the costs. The document, signed by Heidmann, finished with a veiled threat, if our company thinks that the risk is too great, I suggest that I should seek out a publishing company in the United States which could put up the money and ensure that we get the German publication rights. The pair did not show the prospectus to anyone at Stern, but instead presented it to Gruner and Jar's deputy managing director, Dr. Jan Hensman, and Manfred Fischer. They also requested a 200,000 mark deposit from the publisher to secure the rights with Kujau. After a meeting that lasted a little over two hours, and with no recourse to an expert or historian, the deposit was authorized. As soon as the meeting ended, at about 7 p.m., Heidmann traveled to Stuttgart, with the deposit money, to meet Kujau. In April 1982 Walden Heidmann contacted Joseph Hinke and Klaus Oldenhage of the Bundesarchiv, German Federal Archives, and Max Friesulzer, the former head of the forensic department of the Zurich Police, for assistance in authenticating the diaries. They did not specifically mention the diaries, but referred generally to new material. They also did not give the forensic specialists an entire diary, but removed one page only. For comparison purposes they also provided the experts with other samples of Hitler's writing, a handwritten draft for a telegram, this was from Heidmann's own collection and had also been forged by Kujau. Within days Wald provided further documents for comparison all Kujau forgeries. Wald then flew to the U.S. and commissioned Ordway Hilton another forensic expert. None of those involved were experts in examining Nazi documents, and Hilton could not read German. Stern's management were too bound up in a secret of approach to be open about their source, or to provide the experts with a complete diary, which would have led to a more thorough examination of whiter material. From the samples provided, the experts concluded that the handwriting was genuine. Hilton subsequently reported that there was just no question that both documents he had were written by the same person whom he assumed to be Hitler. The purchase of the diaries continued, and by June 1982 Gruner and Jar possessed 35 volumes. In early 1983 the company took the decision to work towards a publication date for the diaries. To ensure wide readership and to maximize their returns, Stern issued a prospectus to potentially interested parties, Newsweek, Time, Paris Match and a syndicate of papers owned by Murdoch. Stern rented a large vault in a Swiss bank. They filled the space with Nazi memorabilia and displayed various letters and manuscripts. The first historian to examine the diaries was Hugh Trevor Roper, who was cautious, but impressed with the volume of documentation in front of him. As the background to the acquisition was explained to him he became less doubtful, he was falsely informed that the paper had been chemically tested and been shown to be pre-war, and he was told that Stern knew the identity of the Wehrmacht officer who had rescued the documents from the plane and had stored them ever since. By the end of the meeting he was convinced that the diaries were genuine, and later said who, I asked myself, would forge 60 volumes when six would have served his purpose. In an article in the Times on April 23, 1983 he wrote, I am now satisfied that the documents are authentic, 
that the history of their wanderings since 1945 is true, and that the standard accounts of Hitler's writing habits, of his personality, and even, perhaps, of some public events may, in consequence, have to be revised. The day after Trevor Roper gave his opinion of authenticity, Rupert Murdoch and his negotiation team arrived in Zurich. A deal was provisionally agreed for $2.5 million for the U.S. serialization rights, with an additional $750,000 for British and Commonwealth rights. While the discussions between Murdoch and Sorg were taking place, the diaries were examined by Broyle and his Newsweek team. After lengthy negotiation Broyle was informed that the minimum price Stern would consider was $3 million, the Americans returned home, informing Hen's man that they would contact him by phone in two days. When Broyle contacted the Germans he offered the amount, subject to authentication by their chosen expert, Gerhard Weinberg. In 1952 Weinberg, a cautious and careful historian, had written the guide to captured German documents, for use by the U.S. military, the work is described by Hamilton as definitive in its scope of the subject. Weinberg traveled to Zurich and, like Trevor Roper, was impressed and reassured by the range of items on show. He was also partly persuaded by Trevor Roper's endorsement of the diary's authenticity. Weinberg commented that the notion of anyone forging hundreds, even thousands of pages of handwriting was hard to credit. Newsweek verbally accepted Hensman's offer and he in turn informed Murdoch, giving him the option to raise his bid. Murdoch was furious, having considered the handshake agreement in Zurich final. On April 15, 1983, Murdoch, with Mark Edmiston, the president of Newsweek, met Schul Hillen, whom, unexpectedly and without explanation, went back on all the previous verbal and therefore, to his mind, non-binding agreements and told them the price was now $4.25 million. Murdoch and Edmiston refused to accede to the new price and both left. The managers of Stern, with no publishing partners, backtracked on their statements and came to a second deal with Murdoch, who drove the price down, paying $800,000 for the U.S. rights and $400,000 for the British and Australian rights. Further deals were done in France with Paris Match for $400,000, in Spain with Grupo Zeta for $150,000, in the Netherlands for $125,000, in Norway for $50,000, and in Italy with Panorama for $50,000. Newsweek did not enter into a deal and instead based their subsequent stories on the copies of the diaries they had seen during the negotiation period. On April 22, 1983 a press release from Stern announced the existence of the diaries and their forthcoming publication, a press conference was announced for April 25. On hearing the news from Stern, Jackal stated that he was extremely skeptical about the diaries, while his fellow historian, Carl Dietrich Bratcher of the University of Bonn also thought their legitimacy unlikely. Irving was receiving calls from international news companies the BBC, The Observer, Newsweek, Bild Zeitung, and he was informing them all that the diaries were fakes. The German Chancellor, Helma Kohl, also said that he could not believe the diaries were genuine. The following day the Times published the news that their Sunday sister paper had the serialization rights for the UK, the edition also carried an extensive piece by Trevor Roper with his opinion on the authenticity and importance of the discovery. By this stage the historian had growing doubts over the diaries, which he'd passed on to the editor of the Times, Charles Douglas Holm. The Times editor presumed that Trevor Roper would also contact Giles at the Sunday Times, while Trevor Roper thought that Douglas Holm would do so, neither did. The Sunday paper thus remained oblivious to the growing concerns that the diaries might not be genuine. On the evening of April 23 the presses began rolling for the following day's edition of the Sunday Times. After an evening meeting of the editorial staff, Giles phoned Trevor Roper to ask him to write a piece rebutting the criticism of the diaries. He found that the historian had made a 180-degree turn regarding the diaries' authenticity and was now far from sure that they were real. The paper's deputy editor, Brian MacArthur, rang Murdoch to see if they should stop the print run and rewrite the affected pages. Murdoch's reply was fucked after. Published out on the afternoon of the April 24th in Hamburg for the press conference the following day. Trevor Roper asked Heidman for the name of his source, the journalist refused, and gave a different story of how the diaries had been acquired. Trevor Roper was suspicious and questioned the reporter closely for over an hour. Heidman accused the historian of acting exactly like an officer of the British Army in 1945. At a subsequent dinner the historian was evasive when asked by Stern executives what he was going to say at the announcement the following day. At the press conference both Trevor Roper and Weinberg expressed their doubts at the authenticity.
and stated that German experts needed to examine the diaries to confirm whether the works were genuine. Trevor Roper went on to say that his doubts sprung from the lack of proof that these books were the same ones as had been on the crashed plane in 1945. He finished his statement by saying that I regret that the normal method of historical verification has been sacrificed to the perhaps necessary requirements of a journalistic scoop. The leading article in The Guardian described his public reversal as showing moral courage. Irving, who had been described in the introductory statement by Koch as a historian with no reputation to lose, stood at the microphone for questions and asked how Hitler could have written his diary in the days following the July 20 plot when his arm had been damaged. He denounced the diaries as forgeries and held aloft the photocopied pages he had been given from Prysac. He asked if the ink in the diaries had been tested, but there was no response from the managers of Stern. Photographers and film crews jostled to get a better picture of Irving, and some punches were thrown by journalists while security guards moved in and forcibly removed Irving from the room, while he shouted ink. Ink. With grave doubts now expressed about the authenticity of the diaries, Stern faced the possibility of legal action for disseminating Nazi propaganda. To ensure a definitive judgment on the diaries, Hagen, one of the company's lawyers, passed three complete diaries to Henke at the Bundesarchiv for a more complete forensic examination. While the debate on the diaries' authenticity continued, Stern published its special edition on April 28, which provided Hitler's purported views on the flight of Hess to England, Kristallnacht, and the Holocaust. The following day, Heidmann again met with Kujau and bought the last four diaries from him. On the following Sunday, 1 May 1983, the Sunday Times published further stories providing the background to the diaries, linking them more closely to the plane crash in 1945 and providing a profile of Heidmann. That date, when the Daily Express rang Irving for a further comment on the diaries, he informed them that he now believed the diaries to be genuine. The Times ran the story of Irving's U turn the following day. Irving explained that Stern had shown him a diary from April 1945 in which the writing sloped downwards from left to right, and the script of which got smaller along the line. At a subsequent press conference Irving explained that he had been examining the diaries of Dr. Theodore Morel, Hitler's personal doctor, in which Morel diagnosed the Fuhrer as having Parkinson's disease, a symptom of which was to write in the way the text appeared in the diaries. Harris posits that further motives may also have played a part the lack of reference to the Holocaust in the diaries may have been perceived by Irving as supporting evidence for his thesis, put forward in his book Hitler's War, that the Holocaust took place without Hitler's knowledge. The same day Hagen visited the Bundesarchiv and was told of their findings, ultraviolet light had shown a fluorescent element to the paper, which should not have been present in an old document, and that the bindings of one of the diaries included polyester which had not been made before 1953. Research in the archives also showed a number of errors. The findings were partial only, and not conclusive, more volumes were provided to aid the analysis. When Hagen reported back to the Stern management, an emergency meeting was called and Schult Hillen demanded the identity of Heidmann's source. The journalist relented and provided the provenance of the diaries as Kojau had given it to him. Harris describes how a bunker mentality descended on the Stern management as, instead of accepting the truth of the Bundesarchiv's findings, they searched for alternative explanations as to how post-war whitening agents could have been used in the wartime paper. The paper then released a statement defending their position which Harris judges was resonant with hollow bravado. While Koch was touring the U.S., giving interviews to most of the major news channels, he met Kenneth W. Rendell, a handwriting expert in the studios of CBS, and showed him one of the volumes. Rendell's first impression was that the diaries were forged. He later reported that everything looked wrong, including new-looking ink poor quality paper and signatures that were terrible renditions of Hitler's. Rendell concludes the diaries were not particularly good fakes, calling them bad forgeries but a great hoax. He states that with the exception of imitating Hitler's habit of slanting his writing diagonally as he wrote across the page, the forger failed to observe or to imitate the most fundamental characteristics of his handwriting. On May 4, 15 volumes of the diaries were removed from the Swiss bank vault and distributed to various forensic scientists. Four went to the Bundesarchiv and eleven went to the Swiss specialists in St. Gallen. The initial results were ready on May 6, which confirmed what the forensic experts had been telling the management of Stern for the last week. The diaries were pure forgeries, with modern components in ink that was not in common use in wartime Germany. Measurements had been taken of the evaporation of chloride in the ink which showed the diaries had been written within the previous two years. There were also factual errors, including some from Domerus's Hitler. Read a new any proclamation in 
1932-45 that Kujau had copied. Before passing the news to Stern, the Bundesarchiv had already informed the government, saying it was a ministerial matter. The managers at Stern tried to release the first press statement that acknowledged the forensic findings and stated that the diaries were forged, but the official government announcement was released five minutes before Stern's. Once the government announcement appeared on television, Kojau took his wife and mistress to Austria, he introduced the latter to Edith as his cleaner. After he saw a news report a few days later, naming him as the forger, and hearing that Stern had paid 9 million DMS, he first phoned his lawyer and then the Hamburg state prosecutor, the forger agreed to hand himself and at the border between Austria and West Germany the following day. When police raided his house, they found several notebooks identical to those used in the fraud. Kojau continued to use a variation of the story he had told Heidmann that of obtaining the diaries from the East but he was bitter that the journalist was still at liberty and had withheld so much of Stern's money from him. After 13 days, on May 26, he wrote a full confession, stating that Heidmann knew all along that the diaries were forgeries. Heidmann was arrested that evening. Following a police investigation that lasted over a year, on August 21, 1984 the trial against Heidmann and Kojau opened in Hamburg. Both men were charged with defrauding Stern of 9.3 million DMS. Despite the seriousness of the charges facing the two men, Hamilton considers that it also appeared clear that the trial was going to be a farce, a real slapstick affair that would enrage the judge and amuse the entire world. The proceedings lasted until July 1985, when both men were sent to prison, four years and eight months for Heidmann, four years and six months for Kujau. In September one of the supporting magistrates overseeing the case was replaced after he fell asleep, three days later the court were amused to see pictures of Idi Amin's underpants, which Heidmann had framed on his wall. At times the case denigrated into a slanging match between Kujau and Heidmann. In his summing up Judge Hans Ulrich Schroeder said that the negligence of Stern has persuaded me to soften the sentences against the two main co-conspirators. Heidmann was found guilty of stealing 1.7 million DMS from Stern, Kojau guilty of receiving 1.5 million DMS for his role in the forgeries. Despite the lengthy investigation and trial, at least 5 million DMS remained unaccounted for. When Kojau was released from prison in 1987 he was suffering from throat cancer. He opened a gallery in Stuttgart and sold forgeries of Salvador Dali and Joan Narod, all signed with his own name. Although he prospered, Kojau was later arrested for forging driving licenses he was fined the equivalent of £2,000. He died of cancer in Stuttgart in September 2000. Heidmann was also released from prison in 1987. Five years later it was reported in the German newspaper Der Spiegel that in the 1950s he had been recruited by the Stasi, the East German secret police, to monitor the arrival of American nuclear weapons into West Germany. In 2008 he had debts exceeding €700,000 and was living on social security. His situation had not changed by 2013, and he remained bitter about his treatment. Point two of Stern's editors, Koch and Schmidt, lost their jobs because of the scandal. Both complained strongly when told that their resignations were expected, pointing out that they had both wanted to sack Heitman in 1981. A settlement of 3.5 million DMS, C1 million dollars, was provided to each of them as part of the severance package. The staff at the magazine were angry at the approach taken by their managers and held sit-ins to protest at the managements by passing traditional editorial channels and safeguards. The scandal caused a major crisis for Stern and, according to Esser and Hartung, the magazine once known for its investigative reporting, became a prime example of sensation-seeking checkboot journalism. Stern's credibility was severely damaged and it took the magazine 10 years to regain its pre-scandal status and reputation. According to the German Historical Institute, the scandal was also instrumental in discrediting the tendency toward an unprejudiced and euphemistic assessment of the Third Reich and West German popular culture. At the Sunday Times, Murdoch moved Giles to the new position of editor emeritus. When Giles asked what the title meant, Murdoch informed him that it's Latin, Frank, the E means you're out and the emeritus means you deserved it. Murdoch later said that circulation went up and it stayed up. We didn't lose money or anything like that referring to the 20,000 new readers the paper retained after the scandal broke, and the fact that Stern returned all the money paid to it by the Sunday Times. In April 2012, during the Levison inquiry, he acknowledged his role in publishing the diaries and took the blame for making the decision, saying it was a massive mistake I made and I will have to live with it for the rest of my life. Trevor Roper died in 2003.
Despite a long and respected career as a historian, according to Richard Davenport Hines, his biographer, Trevor Roper's role in the scandal left his reputation permanently besmirched. In January 1984, Broyles resigned as editor of Newsweek to pursue new entrepreneurial ventures. In 1986, the journalist Robert Harris published an account of the hoax, Selling Hitler, the story of the Hitler Diaries. Five years later, Selling Hitler, a five episode drama documentary series based on Harris's book, was broadcast on the British ITV channel. It starred Jonathan Price as Heidman, Alexei Sayl as Kujout, Tom Baker as Fisher, Alan Bennett as Trevor Roper, Roger Lloyd Pack as Irving, Richard Wilson as Nannan, and Barry Humphreys as Murdoch. Later that year, Charles Hamilton published the second book to investigate the forgeries, The Hitler Diaries. In 1992, the story of the diaries was adapted to the big screen by Helmut Dietl in his satirical German language film Stank. The film, which starred Gotts Georges Heidmann and Uwe Wuchsenecht as Kujout, won three Deutscher Film Preis Awards and nominations for a Golden Globe and an Academy Award. In 2004, one of the diaries was sold at auction for 6,400 euros to an unknown buyer. The remainder were handed over by Stern to the Bundesarchiv in 2013, not as a memento of the Nazi past but as an example of news media history. One of the Sunday Times journalists involved in the story, Brian MacArthur, later explained why so many experienced journalists and businessmen were so gullible about the authenticity of the diaries. The discovery of the Hitler diaries offered so tempting a scoop that we all wanted to believe they were genuine. Once hoist with a deal, moreover, we had to go on believing in their authenticity until they were convincingly demonstrated as forgeries. The few of us who were in on the secret fed in the adrenaline, we were going to write the most stunning scoop of our careers.